Hi, I'm Semenyako. This presentation is entitled Flow Rate Limitations in Analog and Power Electronic Circuits and also an answer to a riddle. Now there is a related presentation which is the riddle. Here is the link to it. And there is a, also a relevant video talking about LM324 structure. And here's the link. The two links are available at the page of the video, YouTube video that you are now watching. So what is flow rate? Flow rate limitation in electronic circuit are due to clamping of physical current and voltage sources. That is the fact that in the physical system, currents and voltage cannot go beyond a certain level. And this brings about a limitation of the rate at which the voltage is rising, the VDT, and the current is rising, the IVT. And this is the subject of this presentation. Now here is an example of some flow rate limitation in power electronics. Here I'm showing a buck converter, a synchronous buck converter. And now suppose at the output we have a change in the current, in the load, a sharp change, a large change. Obviously the voltage will drop and then there'll be a feedback system, which I'm not showing here, which will try to correct this voltage. In order to correct it, the voltage, the average voltage here has to rise and consequently the current will start rising and pumping in current to supply the requirement. Now here, there is a limitation at the rate of this current that it can rise. This is the IDT uh, flow rate limitation. Another example is the case of a half bridge, say an inverter. We have a lower transistor. We are turning it on. There is a current going into the gate and consequently the voltage will start going down, the drain to source voltage. Now this rate of change depends on the current that we are feeding to the gate. And there is a limitation here, of course, and consequently, there is a limitation to the rate at which the VDT is changing due to the fact that the current has a certain clamping to it, that is a certain value of current that you can supply. So these are two examples of power electronics, but I'm going now to go to the more classical issue of flow rate in operational amplifiers. So here I'm showing a classical structure of an operational amplifier which will have a differential amplifier at the input, an intermediate stage, and an output amplifier to supply the current. In most modern operational amplifier, there is an internal compensation, and in many times it is done by having this capacitor across this intermediate stage, or another stage. So there is a capacitor here. Okay, so this capacitor, on the one hand, is helping for compensation, that is to stabilize the system, especially when the gain is one, which is the worst case. And here I'm showing what is really happening and what is the effect of this capacitor. Before compensation, we have a open loop transfer function that looks like that. And consequently, at a gain of one, we have some instability because there's a lot of phase lag. And after, compensation that is with this capacitor, we are actually moving to a lower dominant pole here, to a low frequency pole, and consequently the phase margin at the crossover for gain of one will be much better. So this is the reason for putting this capacitor. Unfortunately, this capacitor is causing a lot of problems. Now there are two ways that you can actually put a capacitor. We can either put it here to ground, there is a GM amplifier, that is the output impedance is high, here I'm showing the output impedance. There is some input impedance or resistance to the intermediate amplifier, so you could have put a capacitor here. The problem is that the value of the capacitance that you need is very large. I mean, it's not very large, but it's large such that the area that you would need on the chip on the die will be large and this is of course very costly. So rather than just putting a let's call it a passive capacitor here, 
We are putting a Miller capacitor, this is the so-called Miller capacitor, and in this case, the capacitance that is seen here at the input, this Miller capacitor, is much larger than the actual physical capacitor that is put across here the feedback. In fact, the value is 1 plus A times this capacitor. So the equivalent circuit of a Miller capacitor around an amplifier would look something like that. We have an input Miller capacitor, which is large, and then we have also an output Miller capacitor, which is, depending on the amplification here, if A is large, then it is about the same as it is originally. Now, wh why is this? Well, we can show it very easily. If I have an amplifier, and I have a capacitor here, a cross between the output and the negative input, then if I have here a test voltage, there'll be some amplification here, and the voltage here will be minus A times this excitation, so the voltage across the capacitor is much larger than Vs by this factor here. Consequently, the current will be much larger. Here is the current. It's the difference of the voltage di divided by the impedance of this capacitor. And this higher current looks from here as if the capacitor is much larger by this ratio. So that the reason for this expanding of the size of the capacitor is the fact that you are generating a voltage here, a negative voltage, a high negative voltage, so you are drawing a much higher current that you would have had if this capacitor would be just here. And consequently, it looks as if you have a much, much larger capacitor depending on this amplification. So this is why we are using the Miller capacitor for compensation to emulate a much larger capacitor with a small size physical capacitor so that we wouldn't need a large area on the die. Unfortunately, this capacitor brings about some problems, and one of them is, of course, the slower that we just uh, talked about. And this can be shown in the following way. If I have an amplifier with, say, a gain of one, like this, okay, and I'm feeding in a small signal, okay, in this case negative, this is actually from the data sheet of 3M324. This is the excitation, it's only 300 millivolt. And at the output, I'm going to, of course, this is the follower, so I'm going to see here the same size of a signal I'm supposed to see. There is some ringing because of the net phase margin of this system. In this experiment, there is also a 50 picofarad capacitor, so that there is another lag here. Also, the crossover is, has some phase lag. So, all in all, we have some overshoot, which is not too bad, and this is for small signal. However, if the signal is large, like here, like here, like 3 volt, okay, then we see that the output is limited at the rate at which the voltage can go up, and this is the slow rate limitation. That is, uh, rather than jumping here all the way, and maybe with some overshoot, it's going up at a fairly slow rate, which is fairly slow, because um, you see that it takes like uh, 5 microseconds, okay, to go to this uh, value here, so therefore, it is a real limitation. It is a real limitation. So let's first of all see uh, also the aspect of, of the effect of this limitation on sinusoidal signal, not just uh, steps, okay? So if we have a small signal coming in, in this amplifier, say riding on some DC, and this would be the input, this would be the output, this would be okay. But if the amplitude of this signal is higher, then we might go into the slow rate limitation. And this is because the amplifier now has to supply this rate of change at the output, and it can't do that. And therefore, 
rather than having this sinusoidal waveform, we're going to have some distorted waveform, sort of a triangular waveform. And of course, this is dependent on this rate here at which the sinusoidal waveform is changing that the amplifier has to follow. So what is the reason for this slow rate limitation? Okay, so to understand this, I'm showing here a general sort of a simplified circuit diagram of an operation amplifier, the LM324. And as I've said, there is a video explaining all the inner circuit of this uh, operational amplifier. And what we see here in general, I'm not going again to cover everything, but just the part that is related to the slow rate. What we see here is a differential amplifier, which is sort of upside down. There is a current source here, six microamp. And then we have the intermediate amplifier. Actually, this is a follower. This is also a follower, and this is a grounded emitter amplifier here. And here we see the capacitor. This is the feedback capacitor, the Miller capacitor that was put in for compensation. So this is now the differential amplifier. We are feeding the signal here. Now in a, say, follower, we're going to connect the negative input to the output. So this is like an amplifier like this. This is this configuration. Now suppose I have a signal coming in, okay? The output will follow it. There'll be a very small voltage difference. So the, the error signal at the input between the two sides. And this is of course going to be very small because the gain of this amplifier is high. So for any given amplitude, you don't need more than maybe tens of microvolts or millivolt in order to get the signal uh, in the range of say 10 volt even, okay? The, the signal that you need at the input is like the output divided by the open loop gain, which is high in operation amplifier. So we have here a very small signal and then this is generating a signal here, this is a differential amplifier, it is loaded by an active load. This is a current mirror, so it's an active load. We have a small signal here, which is then in propagating to the output. So this is normal operation. However, suppose we have a sharp, a large change, okay? If we have a large change, so it's going down. Going down, the output is in a lag, cannot go down immediately. So, at the very beginning, you are generating a large difference between the two sides, okay? This side here already jumped down, and this is sort of lagging, and then you are feeding to this very high gain amplifier overall, a fairly large signal at the beginning. This will cause actually this um, differential amplifier to lock. That is, it'll be actually saturated. And in this particular case, if this is plus and this is minus, so this side will start conducting while this side will be in the off state. It will be cut off. So therefore, the whole six microamp are flowing here, going into this amplifier, and it is limited to this source. So there is no way that this current can be higher than that. Now, if you feed a constant current to a capacitor, obviously the voltage will start rising in a ramp, and this is the slow rate. So the slow rate here, you see, is caused by the fact that the current is limited to this source. There is a large capacitor, and the end result is the limitation of the slow rate at the output. And here I'm showing a positive step. This goes up, but there's a delay, so therefore this is still lower than that. There's a big difference here. Now, in this case, this is plus and this is minus, so this side is now conducting. Here we have a current mirror, so we have the same current going to this transistor, so we are now 
pulling, that you have current in the opposite direction, again limited to this current. So, as it happens, this current source is limiting the current both in the positive and negative direction, and therefore we're going to have a limitation of the slow rate in both directions. So, this explains the behavior that we have seen before. For small signals, while we are actually modulating the current around a certain value, we see the change which is fairly fast. The slow rate here, you might say, is fast, although the amplitude is small. But if the amplitude of the input is high, we're going into the slow rate limitation, and the rise and fall times are fairly slow, relatively slow. Now, it is important to realize that this effect also has a bearing on a sinusoidal waveform as we have seen before, and I'm going to go into it a little bit deeper, and that is the following. If you have a sinusoidal waveform, you have a limitation of the VDT, and we can find out what is this slope here by taking the derivative of a sinusoidal waveform, and the derivative is the peak value times 2 pi f, which is kind of interesting. It says that uh, this product has to be below the maximum dvdt that the amplifier is capable of and consequently uh, I, if you have a high frequency the voltage you can get is small or at low frequency you can get a higher voltage and this is shown here this is actually from the data sheet of the lm324 and what we see is the following. Here, there is a limitation, has nothing to do with the slow, slow rate. This is because the amplifier is fed by 15 volts, so it is limited here, okay? This is a peak to peak. So this is limited to by power supply. Now, as you go to a higher value, then you start having a limitation due to the DVDT. The higher the frequency, the lower the peak value that you can tolerate without distortion. This is like the curve without distortion. It is important to realize that this is not gain. This is a limitation of amplitude. That is, if you are, say, at this uh, 20 kilohertz, okay, then you get a maximum of, say, uh, what is it, say, 6 volts peak to peak. Now, there is no way you can get a higher value, a sinusoidal value. That is, you can increase the input. What you, all you will get is just a more distorted waveform. It will not rise. In the case of a transfer function, what we understand is that this is the ratio between input and output. And if the input is higher, then the output will be higher. Not so in this plot. This plot is a maximum amplitude that you can get at the output without distortion. So we understand then that the operational amplifier slow rate uh, limitation is, is something real that you have to worry about, okay? Obviously, we also understand that this limitation has to do with two factors. One is the capacitance that you see here that you need for compensation and also has to do with the magnitude of the current that you can feed to this capacitor. This means, which is very important, that if you have a low power operational amplifier with small currents in it, this what it means low power, that is the power consumption is low because the currents within the amplifier are very small. So if you have an amplifier of low power, low current, you will get a much slower slow rate. There's no way around it, okay? So if you want an amplifier with a very high slow rate, you will have to compromise and get an amplifier which has a fairly high quiescent current. So this is fact of life. And now I'm going to discuss this riddle that I've posted. Here is the source of this article that I'm referring to. This is posted at the electrical for you website. And the, vid the link to the riddle is given at the page of this uh, video that you are now watching. And 
it is related to this part of explanation of the slow rate. So let me just zoom in. The slow rate then is the I constant. This is the saturated current here divided by C times A2. And then this is the circuit, this is the GM, this is the amplifier, intermediate amplifier. We see it here also. And then it explains the uh, parameters, the GM, what it is, the I out here, the saturated value, the gain here, uh, the slew rate limited uh, voltage here. And then it says that the output can change at a faster rate because there is this um, A2, okay? So this is the explanation. And the question again was to spot at least two errors in this explanation, okay? In, in this part here. So let's see what is the slow rate. There are two ways to go. Let me start with the simplest way, and that is the following. If you have a current source into an amplifier like this, now obviously this current is passing through this capacitor. No question about that. There's no other path for it. The impedance here is supposed to be high. So the current is passing through here, and if the gain is high, and this is what we are talking about. Then the voltage here, the error signal here is very small. So consequently, the voltage across the capacitor is the voltage actually the output. And the voltage across the capacitor at which you have a current I is I over C period. That's it. You have a current passing through a capacitor and the rate of the voltage change will be the I over C. Okay. So this is very simple and very clear. In fact, the Miller capacitor does not play any role here because the current is passing through the physical capacitance and therefore the, the VDT is determined by the current and this capacitor. Now, unfortunately, this current is very small. That's the problem. And so even though this capacitance originally is very small, and we are talking about, say, in practical amplifiers, something like uh, 50 picofarad, then if this is uh, 50 picofarad, but this is the microamp, then uh, you get a DVDT, which is kind of a, li a real limitation. There is another way to do it. And the other way is to indeed invoke the Miller effect. And in this case, I'm showing here now the equivalent circuit after decomposing it into the input Miller capacitor and the output Miller capacitor. So now we have a current going into the Miller capacitor. Now, obviously, this is a much larger capacitor here, okay, by actually A plus 1. And this then, this voltage, which is tiny, is now amplified, okay? So, although this capacitor is large and the uh, changes here are small because of the large capacitance, we are amplifying it and eventually getting an output which is I over C because we are multiplying it by the gain again. That is, the capacitance is larger by about A and then the gain is A so we end up with the same thing. So you can look at it either way. And therefore, this is incorrect. The rate of change in the output is just this current over C. That's it. This is for large gain amplifier, which is the case here, because we are neglecting the voltage here. So this is incorrect. Another error is that it doesn't show that this is a negative input. You cannot have a positive input, but it will oscillate. As a matter of fact, it will be positive feedback. So there is at least uh, two errors here. And also, it says that the output can change at a faster rate, presumably because uh, it's multiplied by A2 and it looks as if the slow rate will be dependent on A2, which is incorrect. A has just to be large enough and the slow rate is just I over C, period. So there was another part to the riddle, which I've added on, and the other part was like that. If we have this Miller 
capacitor and we represent it as this equivalent circuit. The question was, what is I out? This was the second question. Now, if we understand what is going on here, the answer is trivial because this circuit represents the actual circuit. In the actual circuit, the current goes through the capacitor and into the amplifier. That's the way it works. Therefore, in the actual circuit, the output of the amplifier is minus I in, you might say. There's a current going this way. Has to be the same thing here because this is an equivalent circuit. Equivalent circuit means that you have the same current. So therefore, this is I in. So therefore, I out here, this current, this direction is minus I in. So the answer to the second part is again trivial if you understand what's going on that the current here in this equivalent circuit is just the input current only it's uh, the way it's marked here it's a minus sign now what about the power electronics examples that i've given okay here we have a transistor a mosfet driven by a current and the question is, what is the VDT? On what does it depend? What is determining the VDT? Well, as it turns out, we have exactly the same issue here. There is a capacitance, GD, CGD. We have a current. The current at the point of conduction is the difference between the output here and the threshold, this is the current divided by the resistor, this is the current, so we have a, about a constant current limited again by the drive, resistor, and the threshold. This current goes this way, and therefore the same thing as before, the VDT will be this current, or divided by the capacitance, the, the flow rate. So the, to get a higher flow rate, a, a faster switching behavior, you have to either select a transistor with a low CGD or pump in a much higher current so you have a DVDT which is faster. Now what about the IDT? Well, in this case, as we have said, we are in a situation in which there is a jump in the current consumption here, there is a drop, and the feedback, which is not shown here, is supposed to correct it. Now the best the feedback can do is to bring the duty cycle here to about one. This is the best. There's no way you can have a duty cycle larger than one. And if the duty cycle becomes one, then you have here V in. And then the voltage across the inductor is V in minus V out, and the flow rate of the current is divided by L. So therefore, in this case, you cannot get a much higher rate of change in the current than this value. To remedy this, you can use a smaller inductor or maybe inject a current here, which is an entirely different story. But in any rate, one has to realize that this is far beyond the issue of bandwidth frequency response it has nothing to do with it. This is a large signal phenomenon that momentarily at a given point there is a large deviation. If the duty cycle could have been larger than one, what does it mean? It means that like you can increase the voltage here beyond V in because the voltage the maximum here is D over V in and just as a mental exercise, if the duty cycle is larger than one, you'll get a V in larger than one, and then you can in fact get a higher flu rate. And this is sometimes what is done in an auxiliary circuit that has a much larger V in or larger voltage will be connected momentarily in order to increase the IDT. So this brings me to the end of this uh, presentation. I hope you find it of interest. And perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.